<laughs> and then, uh, the, the singularization depends upon uh, what the meaning of the word is is. And this may date me and be a little bit uh, uh, um, it, you know predate uh, your 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 lives even some of you and history. But um, so this was our forty fourth, forty third president of the United States. Served eight years, ninety two to two thousand, and uh, his perhaps uh, most infamous moment was he was being questioned about some uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, I won't say malevolent, but some activity, bad activity on his part. Uh, and in the, in, the, in, the, in the process of being questioned, uh, came up with something glib about what the, the, the word is means. And so I, I cut off the first part just because it's a little bit untoward, but I'll just let you see this. Is that correct? It depends upon what the meaning of the word is. Yes. It depends upon what the meaning of the word is. Yes. It depends upon what. So that's that's he was being asked a question about something he had done and then if, if, if it was something, and and so his answer depends upon what the meaning of the word is, is you know a bit um, more than a more than a, than a little bit of dissembling. Uh, but it, I thought it would be interesting sort of joke to sort of in, introduce what I want to talk about um, in this time with you guys, uh, which is mainly sort of what it looks like, data science looks like in, in practice. And sort of the, the, the main message or the punchline, uh, I'll give it to you first without, you know, in, in, in academia, you sort of wait to the end and you get the punchline, I get the punchline first. Here is that what you'll be presented with if you go off and, and work these corporate sort of jobs and have to come up with things in, in these business sort of settings, what you'll often be presented with won't be data. It'll be what somebody's done or sort of codified in some way. And it's your job to sort of uncover what the data were behind what you've been given. Um, I find with the proliferation of data science, so-called data science, and with a lot of the people in the field not having uh, the training or backgrounds that you guys are availing yourselves of, uh, that there's a, um, the, there, there's a rapidity in sort of just throwing models at something. It's so easy these days to take something and put it in somebody's notebook or throw a function around it and then say, you know, start talking about the output and going from there. Um, it's an improper way to do statistics. Uh, and I think a, 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 a not a helpful way of doing data science. Um, so that, that's the message I'm trying to, trying to give you. I, I'm, by way of example, looking at some of the work that I've done in the corporate setting over the last five, six years. All right. So we'll skip past Bill Clinton. So this isn't just me saying that, you know, that you could read a uh, Nieder, Wasserman, Kuttner, they say the same thing. This is something I repeat at my job every day. Statistics are a function of data. Data are outcomes of experiments. So right, there should be an underlying generating experimental mechanism. If you're sticking numbers on something, there, had, there should have been an experiment, a sample space of the way in which numbers are assigned things, right? When we see data, business settings, outside of academic settings, we just see the numbers. Uh, but you know the numbers aren't, in some sense, meaningless, right? Um, so it's something to always keep in mind in, in business practice: um, what was the sort of original generating mechanism for for what you're being presented with? And so we just uh, and, and and I'm just going to look at uh, three different what they call in business use cases, uh, three different sort of projects I worked on it at three different jobs, and 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 um, unpacking sort of what was asked. And then to what you can deliver from what's asked, based upon uh, refactoring and reframing as, as in, in a in a data sort of aware or experimental design sort of aware way. <clears throat> so themes in, in these next few thought slides, um, always be thinking about what what's what's generating uh, the data. What's the crank that's being turned to spit out these these numbers? Uh, you know, is it a coin flip? Is it the number of successes in a fixed number of coin flips? Uh, is it the, the light intensity at, at a number of pixels? Always be thinking about what the underlying generating mechanism is because that provides the most information for what you can do and what you need to assume uh, in sort of laying a model on top of it. You know, this is just a picture. This is actual data from um, uh, a random effects model that uh, we use in my current job to predict what sorts of people are watching which sorts of TV shows on which networks. And so even something as simple as that, right? Just, just a random intercept uh, belies uh, a, a differential 
generating mechanism, like the people who are going to sit down and watch TNT, for instance, I work at Warner Media right now, um, are different from the people who are going to sit down and watch Adult Swim. Uh, and, and you want to be aware of that when you sort when you when you what you have in front of you are just sort of the log records of uh, how many people watch this thing at a certain time, you know, there's very, very, very different sort of uh, mechanisms behind what drives viewing. <clears throat> and then if, after you worry about the generating mechanism, which, 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 which is, is creating the data, you want to think about sort of the design matrix. Well, now I'm going to think about modeling this stuff uh, in what's going to be predictive. Uh, what are cases, right? Uh, from, from a design matrix would be sort of the fundamental sort of predictive bits of information you have. What can I refactor, reconstruct uh, as given into a predictive feature? Um, perhaps I, I, I can do things to what I've been given, turn sort of a count into a share, things like that. What transformations are, are, are relevant for prediction? And then distribution. Um, now that I'm, I'm ready to apply models, am I going to do it in a distribution aware sense? Am I going to assume everything's multivariate normal? Am I going to use Bayesian models and, and be able to specify uh, priors? Am I just going to throw a suite of uh, so called machine learning uh, models, which really assume multivariate normal data uh, at it? These are all things to think about you know, after you're given a problem at one of these jobs, and it's, it's, it bears repeating. All right. <laughs> this, this picture here, now this is just a, a picture of a but for Kistachrone, it's it's the uh, sort of the path of, of minimum time um, under gravity for a ball to get from one point to another, uh, and just it, simple calculus of variance, calculation, calculus of variant variation problem. Sorry, um, and but it has an, an you know an elegant, uh, interesting solution. So even things that look simple, right, uh, sort of have design principles which we have to you know pause and take care of uh, and investigate carefully. So when I'm going through problems and, and figuring out what I can do statistically with it, I, uh, as for, I, I think of things in, in terms of the things I learned in experimental design, a, a brief sort of coda. Uh, my undergraduate degree is in um, industrial engineering. And so I went to Georgia Tech undergrad. And at the time, they were big on uh, experimental design, I would say even more so than, than sort of traditional uh, statistics, experimental design, control charts and things like that. Um, that's something that I've been able to, that I've relied upon out in, in the working world. I'll say even more than when I was in uh, academic where you had control over the underlying experiment, right? You were setting it up uh, to prove something or demonstrate something or not even really using an experiment itself. You were just thinking about it theoretically. So I, I think about hierarchy. I think about the lower order effects and I always, have those as, as much more important than any sort of higher order effects, right? The, 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 if, it, if, you're, if there's an X on the right-hand side of the model, it's more important to me than the X squared. Uh, sparsity, often, and you'll find these days in, 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 in so-called data science, there, there's a, a surfeit of information available. Not all of it is useful data. Um, and there's a tendency sometimes to throw everything uh, at a model and see what you get. Um, always remember to be trying to prune and get rid of things and get down to sort of the fundamental bits of information. Uh, then heredity, um, people are often concerned about interaction uh, in, in, in from an experimental design setting. Um, if you're worried about interaction, make sure you understand the sort of parent or you know first order level uh, factor or predictor very well. And then causality, you know, I mean, this is, I, 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 I won't say much uh, more than just that here. I, one of the things I like to repeat over and over again um, in, in business in particular is to say is associated with, is associated with. I don't like to use the word correlation and I don't like to use the word cause and effect. Um, it keeps you a lot of trouble to, to stick with the is associated with. All right, so some jobs, this one, let me back up. So I'm gonna talk about some work that I did at Dun & Bradstreet, which is my first uh, corporate job after um, Sorry, was there a question? Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, please. Yeah, so so these terms, right, is associated with, um, I see how they, they keep you out of trouble, um, but is that because, you know, causation and correlation are formally defined, whereas is associated with doesn't have a formal definition? Well, association can have a, a formal definition too, right, and a probabilistic one. Um, uh, but I'll say that the, in answer to it, uh, Part of the reason 
why I, th I like Associated better. One is it's a looser uh, type of uh, um, dependency. It's, it's, it's not assuming sort of a linear dependence, right? You're just saying association in general. That could be any sort of metric or dependence that you could mean. And then two also, yeah, sort of the colloquial or sort of uh, um, the connotation that it, that it yields is, is, is weaker. And then often you wanna make sure that you use the weaker connotation when you're explaining things mm -hmm. to people that, you know, you know, but you said, right? <laughs> so, so it's important, yeah. No, I, I totally sympathize with that. I think that, uh, yeah, there's so many uh, bearing a slight abuse of language uh, in articles because they want to avoid, right, making precise claims they can substantiate. Yeah. Right, right. And, and, and just a couple more sentences on that. This is, of, of, of supreme importance in, um, in, in, in business settings where the language that they use uh, is very different from sort of the language that we learn um, mm -hmm. on thinking of things as experimental outcomes, estimates of parameters and things like that, right? Uh, in the business world, they think, you know, the crank is turned once, the output is what it is, haha, -ha, this is, you know, God has been discovered. And as uh, soon as you realize this is merely one uh, um, outcome of, of many possible. All right. Uh, thank you for the question, Christian. Um, so the, I, in this order, I work these jobs, right? I was working at Dun & Bradfeet first. Dun & Bradfeet is a business to business credit rating company. They're like sort of Equifax, but for businesses. So they try to get as much information as they can about a, a business entity. You know, the business entity is a loose proxy for, for people and their activities in the context of business. Uh, I worked there for, for several years. I moved from there to Barnes Noble Education. Uh, Barnes Noble Education, mainly a, 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 a retail, uh, direct to consumer entity. Um, for instance, on the on, on Columbia University's campus, uh, when I was there, they had a the, an independent bookstore. It got bought out by Barnes Noble Education, and now they have a relationship with the school. You go into the bookstore now; it's Barnes and Noble, um, and so that's Barnes Noble Education. And then Warner Media, where I work now, uh, which is a more a B2B media company, right? Um, it's delivering content uh, through, uh, through movies, through television, through digital, you know, their website, CNN, Bleacher Report. Uh, and what it's looking to receive back is uh, ad revenue. Um, and so my job there is to maximize ad revenue by forecasting which sorts of people are watching which sorts of things and optimizing a schedule around that. So you get the people who are seeing the ads that are most efficacious for them, uh, and so therefore you can charge the most for them. I'm going. I'm leaving Warner Media in a, a month, and I'm going moving on to Warner Music Group, um, where I don't know what the the business uses cases cases will be yet. But you know, any of these jobs, it's maximize revenue. And if you can can conform what you do to the business bottom line, you have a successful career by the by the standards of business. All right. So let's first look at a example of a project uh, that I worked on at, when I was at Dun & Bradstreet. Uh, so I was given a mandate for Dun & Bradstreet has maybe about nine, probably more now, it was about nine billion uh, individual business entities in their data. And so this is worldwide. Um, every uh, business has a unique uh, identifier. They call it a Dun's number. It's something proprietary. But uh, part of what they do is scrape in data of all different sorts, of all different sorts, and try to assign it uh, to each of the entities. So you get a legal filing, you know, they, they pay for a service that gives them a big dump of legal filings. They try to figure out which businesses are being talked about in these legal filings. Is it adverse? Is it positive? Assign it to the, to the you know, the record or business uh, that's being talked about, and then score it up or down uh, in some way. When I was there, uh, one of the things they were very worried about is being able to uh, classify businesses as fraudulent or not. And, and in what different ways could they look at information to give them a signal whether a business was fraudulent or not. Um, so the idea here, and I, I'll just give you the punchline first, uh, we started scraping in uh, for where we could find it just because these sort of automated internet-based things are, are free ways almost to for generating information, uh, find websites that had a business mentioned on it, do the attribution, 
and then categorize the website in some way, like some automated way of sort of extracting or quantifying what was going on in the website. Um, and what was going on, meaning how do we interpret the underlying HTML code or images on the website? So are there ways of quantifying attributes of online business activity that would allow the Nebraska Street to track unique fingerprints of uh, the misspelling of fraudulent actors? And so what we ended up doing, well, I, this slide first. The, and the idea here is if we're able to quantify sort of fraudulent behavior uh, from, from website metadata, basically, would that allow us to uh, create maps of fraudulent actors, people who we knew had interactions through trade information that we had kept separately uh, because they were in our business database and then allow us to identify uh, people who are at risk from fraudulent activity or people who sort of had networks, you know, fraud clusters. Um, and, and that was the challenge. All right, so going back and thinking about principles here, well, there's no natural sort of data generation, right? You're using a web page as, 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 as your model for an observation being spit out. I mean, you could write a sentence around it and say, you know, there's nefarious person, non-nefarious person. They both sit down to write a website. Uh, and one, the nefarious person has, you know, the nefarious coding of HTML and images and, and the, you know, the legitimate person doesn't. But that's what you're working with. The design matrix then is going to be lots and lots and lots and lots of web pages. You know, there's millions or if not billions of web pages. And then the features or predictors are information bits we can construct uh, from the underlying HTML. Can we condense these pages down into to, to relevant sort of information? And the distribution here, uh, multivariate normal, um, empirical distribution. I can't think you, we couldn't think of you know sort of a natural sort of Bayesian way to 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 consider uh, what was being generated by these uh, information bits. All right, so this here on the right, and let me just pull this other one. This here on the right is a, a, a graph of a collection of businesses. Uh, I, 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 part of the punchline here is that these were pre-labeled uh, as things that have been found afterwards as, as being engaged in fraudulent activity. And these are just ways of, con of, 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 of quantifying the, the text the HTML for the website. So we could you know, calculate the number of bits, how complex it was, uh, and the, the, the Shannon information or entropy uh, in, in, in the, you know, the characters on the website. And so what we saw was that there's a difference. So that if you look here in the red, that was older sort of websites that have been classified as fraudulent. You know, you go trying to go to a Gucci website and it's, you type in G-U-C-I and another website comes up and you don't notice it and you're putting in your information. <laughs> Over time, um, the, the number of bits, right? And what, so what's happening behind this? Um, people are using automated methods of making HTML pages and they're more sophisticated. And so therefore they're more information dense. And so the information quantity goes up from in four years, right? The, the thing they're using to generate these websites uh, is, is more sophisticated. But when you look, uh, on the XY plane and on the uh, XZ plane and well, and, and, on the X, and, the, and on the YZ plane as well, you see similar uh, patterns uh, you know, for, the, for, the, for the bivariate conditional distributions indicating that even though there's been a translation here, there's some sort of similarity going on in, in, in the way that these things are capturing uh, information from these web pages. So we started with that uh, about featureizing the HTML code of the business websites, looking for any stability or change over time. Oops, sorry. And then each business, this is just three dimensions. We had other features. And then each business entity is one dot. Each business entity uh, captured by its, uh, um, its web page is a featureized K-tuple. And then oh, a trick I like to play often is to turn things from the original dimension they're on into the uh, multivariate hypercube. It sort of stretches things out. And then you're just looking at the shape of the way things move together rather than uh, the original sort of joint distribution, just the, you know, the dependency part of the, of the joint distribution. And so we saw, so we did that, right? It expands it. And then we can sort of rank things, right? Uh, 
by their this was this was another uh, information bit. I forget what it, LD stands for, but this was just another way of quantifying the web page. And then from this ranking, we could, you know, just, this is just the plot of the empirical distribution on top of this thing. And then from that, go back to a graph uh, that we had in existence from trade activity. You know, the people behind GUCI webpage had had some commerce with Home Depot, say. We have that trade information. And they construct a network and, and pick out places where there was a fraudulent actor. This is interesting for one, you know, scoring the, the business at hand, sort of flagging it for being a, a fraudulent business. Home Depot pays Dun & Bradstreet some money uh, asking about this particular business. And we say, oh, this business has a flag on it for fraudulent activity. Uh, as well, uh, we can give Home Depot a sort of business health report out of all the businesses you interact with, you know, 7% of them are, are, are flagged as, you know, nefarious actors, something to pay attention to. Uh, at the time, people were very worried about not only fraud, but um, um, what do they call that? Uh, human, human trafficking and who in their network uh, was engaged in, in uh, supply chains, right? Are supply chains completely clean? Are there people downstream in supply, supply chains? that are up to no good and and you know the people come protesting outside of your business because you know five suppliers away from you you're related to somebody doing bad all right and that's what i just said you know the network model was for fraudulent cliques we trained on multivariate closeness uh the closeness here was just the the hypercube um and we operated on the multivariate ranks i.e the hypercube all right, so that's Dun & Bradstreet. I moved on from Dun & Bradstreet to Barnes Noble Education. And the first problem I worked on was there a way to minimize course withdrawal? And so I'll step back for a second. Barnes Noble Education, mainly a retail company, you know, selling sweatshirts and books and things like that. And when I joined them, they wanted to, 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 to move along towards becoming an educational technology company and offering educational technology services to the same universities where they have already had relationships, you know, bookstores and booksellers and selling apparel and things like that. And so one of the products that we designed and, and sold was we'll ingest as much data as you're willing to give us uh, about your students, uh, primarily for students in these large online classes. It's even more relevant now with everybody stuck at home. But a lot of these universities would have huge 300, 400 person classes. Uh, and you may or may not know, uh, there was some focus uh, during the Obama administration on uh, a lot of these for-profit schools, which had people come in the door, start to take the class, money is paid, you know, through financial aid, this is the way the American educational system works. People would drop out of the class. The school would still keep it. And so at this time, the, the, the standards had been changed and schools had to prove in order to receive this sort of government financial aid, that um, that students were, were were had a likelihood of success and were persisting in these classes, uh, usually past the first sort of third or or fourth of the class, and so we wanted you know so schools had an interest in, in is there a, a statistical way a scientific way of 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 figuring out who's more likely to drop drop the class at the beginning, and devote sort of the limited academic support resources to them. So that they wouldn't drop the class, so that more kids would stay in, and so that they get more money. And as usual, these things were down to money. So, could, is there a way to predict student performance before they fully underperform? And fully underperforming is failing or dropping out of a class. Those those were the things that the Department of Education was very concerned about. And so, the challenge here: could this, could we generate enough information at the student level? And so, this the predictions here need to be at the individual student level. Uh, on what is essentially confidential uh, personal uh, information, either information that you put on your application when you, when you came into the school, uh, financial aid information when we could get it, uh, things about which classes you were taking and how you performed in them. Well, one of the, the first things we did is many schools wouldn't give us financial aid data. It's, you know, it, you, know you can imagine why a school might not wanna cough that up. Um, one of the things that you may find for those of you who do any social science work is that in, in the United States, the zip code data, 
i.e. Uh, uh, American Community Survey or census data, very, very predictive of, of people's incomes. Uh, you can know a lot about them uh, and, and, and be able to, to have a lot of precision and a lot of different types of models with different outcomes by just knowing their zip code. So we would get their, the kids zip code, right? We, they would send us the sort of course list, minimal information about where the kid had, uh, uh, what they had put in their application, which would include the zip code predictor for us. Uh, and then we also say, this is the University of Iowa, but even better, say, um, I'm trying to pick one with, say, I'm trying to pick one with multiple schools in one area. Uh, not, here, here's a silly example. So say Cleveland State comes to us and asks us to construct a predictive model. Well, this is, they come to us one semester. We don't have much of information around them, but we can look if we have any other information from other schools around Cleveland State. And in, is any of that informative for the task at hand for the students in Cleveland State, like Oberlin, for instance, uh, as any of the ways that those kids behave? And, and, and behavior can be things as so simple as attendance. And attendance is mitigated by things by, like weather and things like that. And so that's another reason why geographic information other local school information are things that can be sort of concatenated uh, and, and, and become predictive data for you. And then sort of emerging trends. Are there other sort of search patterns or things related to the school that could be associated with kids' outcomes? Are our kids, look at the school going up or going down in sort of its ambient um, sentiment? All right. So the data that they were willing to give us is, since these were large, online classes, uh, lots of kids. These classes were heavily run by what are called learning management systems. So when I was at uh, Columbia, did we have Blackboard? Was it Blackboard? I think it was Blackboard at Columbia. You guys are using Blackboard or Canvas or something like that? You're going, I mean, grad school, they don't use it so much, but um, for undergrads, it's a big deal. You put the tests up there. Some teachers use it more, some teachers use it less, but a lot of the activity goes through these learning management software, especially for the online course. And so anytime that a kid is using an LMS system, they're going to generate lots of log data. They, they logged on at this time. They, they looked at this. They stayed on for how long? And reams and reams of, of, of log data. Now, how do you turn what's essentially just transactional time-stamped uh, activity in the things that are going to be useful and predictive? Well, one of the ways is we functionalize it. So we took would take a stream over an entire, uh, well, that's interesting over an entire uh, semester um, and then quantify the number of times they looked, uh, the number of times they looked with respect to the maximum number of times, like which kid in the class, you know, turn counts in the shares uh, and then turn all of that in, in, into a multiple dimensional curve. And then that these curves, you get an individual curve for each student and then you can analyze these curves. Uh, now it's a continuous object, right? And um, frequency and derivative. And it turned out some of these curves and uh, uh, features derived from those curves were very predictive for performance in the class. Stepping back and just, you know, I, I don't like to do these post hoc sort of explanations often. Usually you, you want to have a good reason going in before you make up something and find it works once and then say, haha, that's why it worked. But in this case, stepping back, one can imagine for classes where there's, where there's a fair amount of activity and you can gauge a lot of what people do uh, by just looking online. Um, you know, people who look online more frequently at the class, people who submit their material uh, with, with a lot of sort of latency or people who do it beforehand. All these things we looked at and turned into sort of a, a, um, uh, an individual FDA care for each student. Are the kids turning in the stuff early? Are they turning in late? Are they turning in early or late compared with all the other kids in the class? All of this became information. And then we can do this across all schools. Like how do, how do kids behave in general in certain different uh, classes with respect to their online LMS activity? Uh, and a third thing we did uh, was to look at the transcript information. Now the transcript information, anonymized, right? They're not gonna tell you Kobe took, um, Chihuahua Lowe's class and he got a B and then he took, uh, I don't even know who's there anymore, Victor De La Pena's class 
and he got a B plus. So it turns out kids who take this class and this other class are likely to get around the same grade, but they will give you their transcript information anonymized, uh, which can you can use to develop a sort of association along with it's, it's, it's an academic program, right? So you know which classes proceed, which classes, you know what's likely to come next. So you can sort of prune sort of graph like this, a Sankey graph or flows, and then calculate these associations. And so then it tells you uh, if, if performance in this class is related to performance in this other class. And so we came up with a model for being able to do that from transcript information, anonymized transcript information. Uh, so that's just what I said. So anonymized course grading yields a map of grade and pedagogical dependencies. All of this now is additional predictive information. And so we go back and we now think about our principles again. What's the generator here? Well, uh, the outcome here, if you want to make it the simplest possible outcome is, is this binary. I messed this class up or not, right? I, I got a bad grade or I dropped out beforehand. Uh, but it's hierarchical. There are all these things affecting the kids' environment, where they came from, other, other preparation, which you don't know, which you're hoping you're getting through zip code as a proxy in, in, a, in a course way. Uh, the individual LMS information, how kids behave online for these classes, uh, and, and, and then the course sort of path information. The design matrix here is lots and lots of students. So every semester, um, you know, we had on the order, I, I wanna say like 60 to 70 schools enrolled in this predictive activity, um, hundreds of thousands of observations. Uh, if you want to think of the define, design matrix as a student, uh, if you want to think of it as their log activity, then you know it's huge. Uh, and then features of predictors, we functionalize data from web activity, weighted courts adjacencies, and the distribution here. We're, a little bit, I'm, I'm being a little bit glib by just saying sort of nested Gaussian or a hierarchical linear model, because there were more things that we did in between, but you can think of the final sort of thing, which is a predictor whether somebody's in class, and, and the class here is, you know, they 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 screw up and 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 drop the class or get a bad grade or out of class. It means they just proceed and and, and do it well as a sort of binary logistic, and then all of the parameters uh, for that uh, being Gaussian and nested. And it turned out, you know, we, we could do a pretty decent job. Um, I don't know how well you can see the axis on this middle part here, but these are just, uh, these are illustrations of the discovery rates. Um, so this is true positive. This is the power that we would have to be able to pick up a, a kid as time went on uh, over a semester. And this is the false positive. This was, you know, the kids who we would say needed help. And, and as it turned out, they didn't, they did well. Obviously the most important thing here was, was power. If the school's worried about money, they want to make sure somebody doesn't drop out. They want to throw resources at them, but also false positive is important too because they have limited resources, only so many deans. Uh, you can't have uh, the deans chasing down. I mean, like the <laughs> how to have a per perfect true positive rate is to say all the kids need help, right? And uh, then you just help everybody, but you don't have enough resources to do all that. But that, uh, so we would we we actually included the sort of discovery rate balancing in the model uh, retrospectively to see where we could do better at tuning other things. Uh, but it, but it, it worked well. And, and, and again, stepping back and, and I'm saying, I wouldn't say as a rule, you want to sort of come up with an explanation after having done something and say it was good. Uh, one could think, I, I know, and you guys will know, you know, soon enough, and probably already for those of you who've been teaching already or will be soon, when you walk into a classroom on the first day, you can tell who's going to screw up and who's not. Uh, some kids are sitting at the front, some kids are sitting at the back. Some kids are showing up uh, or, or talking, some kids are paying attention, asking questions. And this is a roundabout way of trying to get at you know that, right? That's the data you really want to get at, but you can't do that in an online setting. All right. And the last thing I'll talk about is that the current job, um, and I, let me give you a bit of background for this. So the way a lot of ad tech works. So say you're looking at CNN uh, and earlier in the week, you were looking for a nice pair of shoes. If you're reading this article on CNN, you see an ad pop, pop up. Um, it's, it's Zappos, you know, and you, you, know, you look at the actual sort of content or graphic that they gave you, the creative they gave you, and it looks like shoes similar to the one that you bought earlier this week. That's happening because the ad tech companies have what's called identity graphs, where they're able to, in an anonymized way, 
<laughs> in an otherwise way, assign to your device and your web activity uh, uh, uniqueness, right? And so when you're online and you're looking at something else, they can push you ads that are relevant for you because you've been identified. So identity resolution is a big part of how ad tech works at the digital level. And it's going to be a big part of how ad tech works in the so-called linear uh, space, which is just TV. Uh, when you turn, you know, flip on the TV. And so soon enough, you're, you're going to get ads on TV that'll be relevant to, to you or what's been tracked about your device. So Warner Media um, is a collection of um, uh, television networks, Warner Brothers Studios, um, HBO, uh, now, you know, video on demand subscription service, HBO Max, all of these different uh, uh, content or publishing portals. Uh, and what Warner Media has built, you know, over the time that I've been there, and I, and I can't say this is, is my project, I'm only involved in this way, is an identity spine, which is you see something from Warner Media either through an account and direct TV or uh, you looked at CNN's website, or you looked at something sports and Bleacher Report, there's an instantiation of, of, of your behavior in, uh, in a device graph. Uh, and so the idea here is because we can't put down, Kobe looked at CNN and then he looked at to see how you know, the Lakers were doing uh, because that's illegal, um, but anonymized devices can be followed and concatenated or aggregated in the so-called household, a household being just a person. Uh, and that information then is used to sort of keep track of your activity. Now, it's the sort of thing that can't be just done once. It's the sort of thing that has to be done and refreshed and refreshed and refreshed and refreshed. The entire sort of graph has to be refreshed, right? People come in and out, devices change. I have an old phone, I throw it away. I get another phone, I move, I have a different IP address, IP addresses change. There's a vorticity going on behind uh, this, this networked model, which is uh, your device and the, and the, the things that it's looked at uh, that, that's changing. And so there's a model on top of that that tries to account for that and, and refresh this thing. What me and my team were tasked with, um, the device graph that we're using at Warner Media is, is what one would call greedy. It tries to grab every activity that it can see on every device, and then in a, in a, in a loose way, construct uh, identities from those activities and, and their devices, throw it all together so that you can capture as many as possible. One can imagine that, that uh, in, in a business where you're, you get paid to show advertisements to as many people as possible, it's not an unreasonable thing to have a sort of greedy device graph, right? It's not unreasonable to say, ah, you know, I've got all these people and if I show something to Kobe, there's 10 devices associated with them and I'll push them to all of them. Uh, because when I go back and I say, I ask Zappos for the money to pay, um, I'll be able to say that, well, I sent these ad, this ad to Kobe and I sent it on his 10 devices. So he definitely saw it, right? Or these 10 different devices saw it. So there's, there, there, there's a, a business decision in, in having a graph that's, that, that's sort of dense, large, and perhaps greedy. There's a, there's a contradictory, though, uh, impulse from CCPA, which governs privacy rights, which gives people the ability to say, hey, co you know, I write into a company. I don't want to see any more shoe ads. As a matter of fact, take me off of your device graph totally. I don't want to see any more ads from you. And so then the organization has to go back and delete all the, the devices, my part of the graph, my household, uh, and the devices connected to it um, to match my request. And that has to be you know, done to a reasonable standard. So there's a balance between grabbing as many as possible uh, and also being parsimonious so that when these, I might as well just click this one now, when these so-called do not call requests come in, that you're not throwing away uh, people who haven't asked for it. So for instance, I'm at my house, I have all my devices, a friend comes and visits. A friend comes and visits and she, you know, is looking for a new pet cat. The device graph is constructed, she connects to my, oh, what's your internet password? She connects to my IP address. The device graph is constructed. Her device, her household information is included with mine because she was on my IP address looking at, at cats. Is there a way to pick up 
when I say I don't want my information uh, pushed to me anymore, when I want to be deleted from the database to not delete hers, right? How can I differentiate between my household, my activity, hers, her activity, her devices? And so this is the part that, that I worked on, um, on being able to take a greedy graph and sort of prune it in some way. And, and, and as well with the constraints and the data that you're provided. That's another sort of thing I'll say is you'll often not be provided with the perfect data for the, uh, the, the task at hand. You'll have to figure out how to manipulate what you have uh, into being close to what's being asked for. All right, so in a picture, it's like this right here. So this is my friend, this is me, <clears throat> the graph, the greedy graph is constructed and they put us both in the same household, this big cube here is the same household. Is there a way I can score or differentiate between this is my friend and this is me and then put a line here and when I get deleted, it just deletes this and it leaves my friend and, and her, her pet cats and, and her Samsung phone. All right. So what we're given is, as data, and that's another thing I should, I should say here. So in, in, it's one, you know, one level of abstraction is just to say often you'll be given things as data that aren't. Another second is you'll be given things as data that just don't match what you're being asked. And then another abstraction or thing to say is you'll be asked to devise something that fits into the, the current sort of procedural flow. So there's been a lot of time and energy spent on being able to drag in all this information and then construct an adjacency behind it, right? That, that, that's the actual so-called graph. Uh, don't mess that up, but find a way of taking what's, what's already been constructed as an adjacency, the sort of you know, background decisions already haven't been made on, on doing that and just look at sort of the topology that comes out of it. So say this here as an individual household uh, and a household here that is the IP address. Here's a device, device four. This is an individual, any information in log files, another theme in log files that you'll get between device four, say Kobe's iPhone and this IP address, individual level features. You can turn all that stuff and you featureize it. How often did this connection happen? What was the minimum time it happened? What was the maximum time it happened? Did it exceed those? Did it happen during work hours? All sorts of different ways to try to extract data from this connection right here. And then features that are, well, this, let me just see if this will go. Yeah, all right. And then things that have to do with all these other devices or that connect to the same IP or the same household all that's information that you want to be able to use as predictive for whether this thing should be here in this household too. So there's individual features, clique-wide features, uh, all of these things to construct a data structure around. So what we just did was use a, a, a shrinkage model, um, classified the sort of features we could construct as either having to do with the actual device itself and the household or the entire sort of clique of the household uh, and then put a constraint on uh, the sum of the estimators so that some, you know, you're, you're, we're being as, as uh, to use the word again, we're being as greedy as possible in, in, in constructing information from essentially what are log data. Uh, some of that we want to throw out, some of that we don't need to be in the model. So we use a shrinkage model, lasso, ridge, support vector with radial basis. Any of these things uh, will allow us to do classification, but with shrinkage. Another sort of theme in, 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 in the corporate world that, that I like to, to repeat and, and, and champion is not in providing just a specific answer for this one specific problem, but providing an apparatus uh, that can deal with problems like this in the future. And by an apparatus, it's scientific. It, it can be the code that's used, the computing environment that's used, but more often I'm referring just to the, the data structure necessary to turn what they've given me into real data and having that persist so that it can be done again, it can be done in a different way, it can be done in a more sophisticated way, really turning sort of a data science practice to a scientific sort of enterprise as much as you can. So our apparatus, we start off with log files, we turn those into a null graph, just did this device connect to this IP address sort of thing. We construct households, we look for membership <laughs> for when you're doing classification problems and, and, they're, and they're severely unbalanced you sometimes want to tune uh, or reweight uh, in class or out of class. Um, 
we put in more topological features, and then we look lastly uh, at classification algorithm. And we have all this set up as, as different code bits uh, in our environment that can be modified later. As a fair amount of EDA, um, so I'm looking at a classification model. I'm really interested in, in variable importance. So I think that still ended up in the model, even though I, I used a, a, a shrinkage constraint. And so then I look at conditional variance of features uh, with respect to the output sort of label uh, or predicted value. Uh, and, and I and I pass to, I look at importance, I look at coefficient values. And one of the things I'll say, and 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 you know, the world is changing, and, and so this you may not suffer this as much as, as I've had to suffer in my, my career. I, I'm, there was a time, I, I think when I was four or five years into being a professor, that I just couldn't hear the word regression anymore. I had seen so many either just least squares regressions or other types of regression, and people were sort of spitting out lists of coefficients, which is really just, you know, the conditional, um, it, it, it's the, the, the effect in a series, right, of, 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 of predictors. And I, I've noticed, you, you know, you change something, you, th you throw out one uh, predictor or one covariate and the signs and all the rest of them will change, the magnitude of the rest of them will change. Because what you're getting out of it is an estimator for that set of, of predictors on, on the conditional expectation, not some exogenous relationship between something predictive and, and something you're trying to predict. So, you know, I, 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 I try to deal with these lightly, I look at them, see if they're stable but not sort of repeat, ah, you know, 0.742 is the effect of having two hops between a device uh, and an IP address. I, I don't like to those, those that to be determinant. Just more sort of the apparatus. And so this is what you give back to them. You, you turn logs into no graphs, turn those into households, and then do classification. And it's just a very sort of simple modular way of, of addressing the problem. And each of these can be changed, the log data change, you only need to change this here. If you want to think of co-location differently, all of these are sort of design elements, right? And an experiment designed to produce the output that they're being asked. And then lastly, and then this slide and the next slide, I'll just show you. So what we're being asked again is sort of to discriminate uh, uh, devices activity for a do not call list. When you go back and you look at the validation data on things that were actually should have been discriminated or not, you really want to test if what you get out of it is giving you the discrimination necessary because that's sort of the business use case. Uh, I'll skip past this one. This is just more on, on weight adjustment. And then lastly, um, so, so these classification models are generating uh, propensity to be in class, right? Either one. If you're using something that's strictly zero one, you can interpret it as a probability. Uh, uh, if it's not like support vector, it's still a propensity, right? It just has a minimum and a maximum. Um, in business use cases, people usually like to get things and in, in things that they understand uh, uh, or can interpret. So then we just fit you know, a curve to the output predicted value and then bin it, you know, really high A in the middle B, the middle C. And these are all things that can be tuned and are part of your sort of design and output process. More on feature importance, conditional variance, looking at conditional variance pots, plots. And the use case here, the what we the what we get out of it should be able to take two different households, right? That have been classified as one, i.e. in the big square, and then cut them. What we found in, in the you know penultimate version of it is that the scores would be lower, but not significantly so, not, not low enough for the business UK. So sometimes you'll find that you're putting your thumb on things. And this is, again, I, I think uh, an important thing to say about, about so-called data science, it's, it's statistics, right? Um, and the, this model here for classification or propensity isn't, isn't God. It's, just, it's a way of trying to get at this problem. Um, so this part here, this, this penalization, is, is more of that. And you try to do things in a coherent way, but I, I don't, I, I, you don't need to be beholden to fitting one model, uh, seeing what it does, and then being frustrated if it doesn't work. You know, there are other things to try. 
So the, the penalty that we use at the end, so the original sort of classification of shrinkage, and then we just penalize it by uh, basically hoteling, hoteling's uh, T squared or Mahalanobis distance. Um, pick the biggest possible subgraph in a graph. Uh, let that be the, uh, the centroid for calculating this distance, if you will, and let the covariance between the features on that subgraph be your plug in estimator for the covariance matrix, and then take the distances from everything else uh, and then penalize it, uh, penalize your propensity by that distance, thereby lowering uh, the score of everything that's not in that um, in, in the largest subgraph and, and making it more likely that it gets cut off and, and put into separate graphs. All right. So again, uh, principles. So what's the generator here? It's hard to even uh, pick out what an, an actual generator is here for this sort of device graph, ID spine sort of thing. Uh, the generator really is, is your behavior on, on your devices mediated by technology, right? Uh, and the answer really to, to doing this appropriately is just being very, very careful on, on the signals that are used to connect the device to a person, to rubbing around the household around them. For the reason I said earlier, um, many businesses aren't as concerned about that part because it's advantageous to be greedy and rope as many as possible. The design matrix. So the design matrix here, what we get out of it is basically uh, features we can construct on the adjacencies or co-locations uh, on a device graph after it's already been created. And then the features or anything we can turn those co-locations into, timestamps, augmented by other stuff, all sorts of interesting creative ways of turning what's essentially just a link between a device and an IP into data. And then the distribution here, you know, the strictly frequentist approach, right? They're, they're, we're using empirical distribution, vari variable selection, and then a post hoc penalty. There's no sort of posterior estimation. All right. A little bit more. So I have not started this new job yet, but uh, this is sort of the point of departure and the things to think about, things I'll be thinking about when I walk into the door. Um, you know, the goal will still be uh, what is the business doing and, and how is it making money uh, and what can it do to make more money? Um, it's a music company. Uh, so the generator here, complex generator, right? Uh, the, the thing that they're producing is actual music. Uh, are there ways of quantifying music? Are there ways of quantifying how type of music affects audience consumption? Uh, and type of music can be something as coarse as pop, R&B, or something as complex as the actual wave file. Or did we use timpani drums on this one? Was this a summertime banger or things like that? The design matrix. Uh, in these media type companies, you're always looking at cases of the audience or average audience. Um, one of the pushes is to get to individual resolution. Uh, time, how things change over time, consumption over time, and the artists and creative stuff themselves. Features and predictors, I don't know yet. I haven't started the job. And then distribution, who's to say? It will be seen. But I'll go through the same exercises that I've been going through at these other jobs to try to divine what's really uh, data and then think about ways that with statistics can sort of help it. All right, so this last slide. So back to the statistics or function of data, I, I, you know, I still teach an introductory statistics class at uh, Seton Hall. I say this probably every class, it's a statistic of the function of data, data to outcomes of experiments. <laughs> I leave off the last part, except in business practice. In, in business, your job is, is to match that as closely as possible by being creative and understanding what you're doing. And so deep thoughts, there used to be this TV show, uh, Sat, uh, they're still at Saturday Night Live and they would have this little bit and they would call it deep thoughts. The guy would just say these nondescript things at the end of the show. But so the deep thoughts here are understanding what the data are, I think is more important than the manipulation, right? Really, really having a good sense of what's generating this uh, is more important than just taking what you're given and, and sort of fitting it to whatever model you can get. Uh, if you have to, to choose between scale and repeatability, I, I would cleave or, or lean to, so if you're, if you're at a job, you know, constraint in the, in the people you work with or the amount of time you have, I always cleave towards leaving an apparatus at the job, right? Like I always cleave towards, I've constructed a way for you guys to do this in perpetuity uh, rather than I did something really fast and, 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 and sort of forthwith uh, to give you what you needed right away. I found that, that leaving these sort of apparatuses behind 
has people think good thoughts about you and allows you to go and get another job. And then lastly, I just wanted to give you this little clip here. So now since I'm going to work for a music company, I don't know if you guys can hear this. This is, again, this is dating myself. So this is a group called the San Francisco Jazz Collective. San Francisco Jazz Collective. Um, and this is their interpretation. You know, let me, let me stop this for a second. This is their interpretation of an old song by Michael Jackson. And so one of the things I like about jazz and, and this, it's a message to be given here. You know, I should say this, you know, back when I was uh, in, in grad school, uh, the student seminar, we had one summer, this guy, uh, Dick DeVoe, who used to teach at Princeton, but now teaches at Williams, came and gave us a talk. And, and he, he writes his introductory textbook called uh, DeVoe, Velvet and Bach, Statistics, Introduction, whatever. And um, one of the quotes he gave us was that uh, music was like math and statistics was like literature, that like you could have savants say in music or in math, they could just pick things up. But in statistics, you sort of needed to know a lot of stuff uh, in order to do it beforehand. You couldn't just pick it up and do it. I'm not, I won't deny that, that I think that's true. In, in statistics, there's a, a lot of it is idiosyncratic and you just, you learn by doing it and picking it up and, and regularizing it, not just sort of, you know, looking at it de novo. Having said that, just like in music though, a lot of the idiosyncratic things you can do, for instance, in jazz come from having lots of practice and being able to do the sort of rote things, right? And so you're really good at playing scales. Eventually you can turn a Michael Jackson song into a really nice jazz song. Uh, and that's it, that's, that's my talk. And let's, let's hear a little bit. All right, any questions? And, I, and I'll send this to, to Diane so you can play that link yourself. So I, I, I know you will. Thank you, Kobe. You're welcome. Um, yeah, so if anyone has questions, they can go ahead and ask. All right, if there are no questions, that's fine. Um, I have to go back to work. 